Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. For those of you joining us for the first time, on behalf of International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society, we'd like to welcome you to the AE Speaker Series in connection with AE Awareness Month. Oksana Sweeney serves on the Board of Directors for IAES, and she'll be your moderator today. We've been fortunate to recruit true experts in the field to help advance our understanding of the emergent thinking across the spectrum of clinical experiences. If you've attended the previous webinars, you'll recall that we covered a lot of ground specific to diagnosis, treatment, long-term management strategies of patients with autoimmune encephalitis. Today, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Belinda Lennox, who's joining us from Oxford in the United Kingdom to talk to us about autoimmune psychosis, which is often thought to be one of the presenting features of autoimmune encephalitis, but could also be many other things. We're lucky to have Dr. Lennox discuss the concept of autoimmune psychosis, what we know, what we don't know, in particular, the overlap between what we call a psychiatric illness, schizophrenia, and what we call a neurological illness, autoimmune encephalitis, and whether they're two sides of the same coin. Dr. Lennox is an associate professor at the Department of Psychiatry, University of Oxford, in the United Kingdom, an honorary consultant psychiatrist in early intervention and psychosis services for Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust. She trained in the general adult psychiatry in Nottingham, Oxford, and Cambridge. Her doctorate was in fMRI of auditory hallucinations, and she then undertook further fMRI studies in psychosis. Before moving into neuroimmunology through a collaboration with Professors Alistair Coles at the University of Cambridge and Professor Angela Vincent at the University of Oxford. Her interests are in discussing the causes of and developing more effective treatments for people with psychosis and in implementing those discoveries into clinical practice. She runs a clinic jointly with neuroimmunologists for patients with neuronal cell surface antibodies, and because of her extensive training, is able to share a unique perspective on the topic at hand. A few words to you about the ground rules. The content of this talk is not to be considered any medical advice to the extent that it you may find information relevant and applicable to a specific case please discuss further with your managing physician. And at the end of the, of the talk, we will have a Q&A opportunity. Dr. Lennox cannot give individual medical advice to people when answering a question, but she can uh, talk in general terms. And so with that, it is our pleasure to present Dr. Belinda Lennox. Uh, just in case you don't know them. So Angela Vincent on the top there, who's my colleague in Oxford, um, was the first one to describe the voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibodies back in 2001. And that was the first description of an antibody causing an encephalitis, that um, removing the antibody treated the encephalitis. And since then, it's been further described that the particular um, proteins are the LGI1 and the Caspa2 antibodies um, the particular bits of that potassium channel complex. And then the major discovery, of course, of the NMDA receptor antibody by Joseph Dalmau and colleagues uh, at the bottom there, and now in Barcelona. Um, and that, that has, um, you know, been far more um, you know, common than any of the other antibodies all added together. But a whole list of other ones, and they're still being described in rare um, cases, and they each have slightly distinct kind of clinical associations with them. But the one I'm gonna focus on just because that's where most of the research is, is the NMDA receptor antibody. And I think it has particular importance for psychiatry. So you may have seen this before. This is um, the European um, series of patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis to show the progression of symptoms that you see with the disorder. It's about 400 odd patients and each dot is a person, and it's to show the time course of the illness. So as you know, it's a really rapid onset illness, 
um, that usually starts with psychiatric symptoms. It's all lumped together as one section, psychiatric, and then rapidly over two or three weeks, people become very unwell um, and their symptoms progress. And so they might lose consciousness and they might have breathing problems and blood pressure problems that mean that they need treatment on an intensive care unit. So that's kind of the well-described, well-understood um, clinical syndrome of NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis. And these are the treatment response data. I apologize that they're in a bit of a, um, this is the, the format that was actually presented in the research paper, but you know this also already that it's really important to treat people quickly and treat people aggressively. So this just shows again, a dot per person. This is the 400 odd people, IT being immunotherapy. So things like high dose steroids or plasma exchange or IVIG. Um, and if it's given in less than about six weeks, it makes a big difference to your outcome. So on the Y axis um, up vertically there is the outcome scale, which is the MRS, the modified ranking scale. And that is the whole of life compressed onto six points with naught being completely well, back at work, no symptoms and six being dead. So giving immunotherapy in less than six weeks is a difference between being, you know, in institutional care and being completely well and back at work. So this is transformed care. This is why there's an urgency to treating this disorder that people will often treat it before they have an antibody test back if it's such a suspicious clinical presentation. This is what happens in, in neurology, but it's not what happens in psychiatry. Um, and the case I make is that all of those clinical symptoms that are seen and described as part of autoimmune encephalitis have also been described for over a hundred years as part of schizophrenia as well. So, you know, the seizures, there's a greatly increased risk of seizures with schizophrenia. The cognitive impairment, I've already told you, it's the most leading cause of disability with the disorder. The movement disorders as well are absolutely part and parcel. Even the more sort of dramatic presentations of people collapsing and losing consciousness and having unstable blood pressures is well described. And we call it a different thing. We call it neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is basically just blaming the drugs. We think it's the drugs causing um, the problem. But what about if it's actually an underlying encephalitis? This was the work trying to unpick what the psychiatric presentation was like. Can you tell with somebody at the beginning of their illness that they have encephalitis and not something else? which is a really important question, isn't it? Because psychosis, schizophrenia is common, encephalitis is very rare. So can you tell by the nature of the symptoms whether they've got one thing or another? This was the work of um, a PhD student of mine, Adam Aldawani, who went back to all of those 460 odd patients with def definite encephalitis and looked back at their psychiatric symptoms that they started off with and he, categorize them basically, put them into different groups of kind of symptoms and you'll see them represented there. So um, the top, the sort of pink block is sort of behavior change broadly. So most people had quite severe behavioral problems, sort of personality change, often aggressive or agitated. You know, people were very disturbed, often harming themselves. Um, such that they were often on, on psychiatric inpatient units. Um, about two thirds of people had uh, frank psychotic symptoms, you know, hearing voices or having delusional beliefs. About half of people had um, frank uh, mood disturbance, and that was either elated mood, too high or too low, basically, very depressed. Um, a third of people had this uh, um, unusual movement problem of catatonia, where people, you know, might hold fixed positions for a long period of time, or you know, or were unable to speak, were mute. Um, that's all part and parcel of um, catatonia. Uh, Twenty percent of people had prominent sleep problems, so either 
a sort of reversal, sleep-wake um, reversal, um, or very bad um, night terrors or nightmares were of often reported as well. Um, and, then, um, and then more unusual presentations at the bottom there. But if you see in the sort of the, the Venn diagram on, on the right-hand side, you'll see that the majority of presentations were a whole mixed bag of stuff, basically. There was nothing distinctive to say that this is the characteristic psychiatric presentation of encephalitis. Most people had a bit of everything. Most people were very unwell. So that was, that was the take home from that study. I want to just highlight this study to you if you haven't seen it already, because I think this is really important. Um, the stories I hear are often of people in psychiatric services, you know, family members often thinking this isn't quite right, doesn't feel, you know, you know there must be something else going on and, and not, you know, managing to access testing or not managing to get into the neurological um, sector to be treated. Um, and this was a study that just confirms all of your experiences as being valid, I guess. This was a, a screening study. So it's a really simple design. It was run by James Scott, who's a psychiatrist in Queensland. And he tested just 113 um, inpatients, sequential in inpatients. So everybody was included, basically. However unwell you were, whether you were on an intensive care unit, psychiatric intensive care unit, you got a blood test to look for antibodies. And in 113 people, he found six that had antibodies. And you'll see that this is this were the reasons that they were in hospital in, in, the, in the psychiatric hospital. Um, and this is the sort of standard sort of diagnosis that people are given. Um, you know, they're given a diagnosis of first episode of psychosis or schizophreniform disorder, so schizophrenia-like illness, or the top person um, was, you know, thought to be caused by the drugs that they were taking you know, cannabis induced. Um, and you see the sort of people, you, I suppose what stands out to me is that three of these um, people were children, that, you know, a 13 year old boy, um, a 16 year old girl and a 16 year old boy, really young presentations. And the other thing that stands out to me is the short length of um, illness. So, you know, a handful of days, these people had been unwell um, before, they were, before they ended up in hospital. So he found um, four of them had NMDA receptor antibodies, one had a potassium channel antibody, and one of them had an antibody that with an unidentified target. Um, two of them had had a seizure, the, other, um, the others hadn't. But this really highlights that um, what was needed was then to investigate people. So for everybody that had a positive test, he did lumbar punctures. And this is really crucial. This is how you make the diagnosis. And if you look, you find inflammation and you find antibodies. So these patients had raised white cell counts, high levels of protein or NMDA receptor antibodies in their CSF. And that's it. That's the diagnosis made. You don't need to go any further. The other investigations weren't that helpful. So MRIs were normal. Um, an EEG, you know, might have been normal or might have shown something nonspecific. It really was the lump puncture that was helpful. Then what he did, which was even more remarkable, was that he treated people. So the first two people, if you remember, the top one was thought to have a cannabis-induced psychosis. They were found to have an ovarian teratoma. You know, these patients are there in mental health settings. And of course, if you find a teratoma, you should take it out. So that's what he did. I, I mean, not him personally, but you know, they had the teratomas removed, first two patients. They were all given standard treatments that you would give, you know, IVIG, rituximab um, or steroids. And the patients that were treated got better and they went back to work, they went back to uni, working full time. And of course it's only a handful of patients, but it's really striking to me that this was done in mental health settings um, this was before patients had uh, ended up on ITU. They, they weren't under neurologists at all. OK, so in an effort to try and raise awareness amongst psychiatrists, um, Tom Pollock, who's at King's College London, and myself and a group of experts got together to develop consensus criteria along the lines of the Grouse criteria for encephalitis. So these are our red flag symptoms that we propose as diagnostic criteria 
for autoimmune psychosis, of when you should suspect that someone has an autoimmune cause to their illness. Um, and looking down the list, I mean, you might say that that's, it's not very ambitious. So all it's saying is that if you have a risk, that means that you might have encephalitis. So if you have any of the symptoms of encephalitis, um, or if you've had a recent tumor, or um, you know a loss of consciousness, then you should be suspicious and you should test people. So uh, my take on this, it's not that controversial, but it's a starting point. It's basically saying if you have any of the symptoms in encephalitis, you should definitely be tested for these antibodies and you should, it, it should be explored as a possibility. But I actually wanna go further than that because I think you know, there's actually a proportion of people who have psychosis, who don't have these other red flag symptoms, who might also have antibodies. Um, who might also benefit from treatment. So I'm just gonna tell you a bit about our research along those lines. So to start with, we did a screening study of people with first episode psychosis right at the beginning of their illness, less than six weeks, um, and we tested them for antibodies. And we tested a control population as well, which is really important. And this is what we found. We found 3% of patients had NMDA receptor antibodies and a few had LGI-1 antibodies and CASPER-2 antibodies and GABA-A antibodies as well, um, which was a surprise to us. Um, and a, a few of the controls also had antibodies, which was also a surprise to us because no one had ever done that before um, to show that. So it's not, it's not completely straightforward is the take home from this. It's just because you have an antibody doesn't necessarily mean it's causing the illness because you can have antibodies and have nothing wrong with you. Um, but for something about the NMDA receptor antibody particularly doesn't seem to be seen in healthy control subjects. If you take our study, um, our case control study, and combine it with all of the other studies that have been done in psychosis, you get quite a confusing picture. So, and this is quite a controversial area where you'll say some people saying it's absolutely it's irrelevant for psychosis. You know, you don't see any antibodies in patients with psychosis compared to other members of you know, the population and groups like me that think it thinks that there is a relevance. And you'll see a huge range of results. This is, these are all the studies that have been done, all sort of plotted um, with um, the, the vertical line there being no difference between patients with psychosis and control. So some studies show you know, 15, 20% positive rates and some, some large studies showing no difference at all. We tried to understand why this might be and we think we have the answer. We think, and we've just published this actually this month, we think it's the answer with the test that's used. It makes a big difference how you test for these antibodies. So there's different types of tests you can use, some of which are much more sensitive than others. So the live cell-based assay, um, which is available in some research groups, um, is much more sensitive and picks up, if you see in the top left there, picks up about 4.5% of patients with psychosis um, with the antibodies. So four times more likely, I should say, in um, patients than controls. Whereas if you use the sort of commercially available, widely available um, test, you don't tend to pick up any difference between patients and controls. And that's the reason why some studies don't show any difference. There seems to be a little bit of an indicator that if you test people acutely at the beginning of their illness, you, you're more likely to see the antibodies, um, but that's, that's not such a clear um, difference basically. Okay, so do patients look any different? Is there anything distinct about the people that I find with an antibody compared to those that don't have an antibody? Well, a couple of um, clues. Everybody with an antibody um, in, that I have found has a very acute onset, a very you know, abrupt onset to their illness. It's a matter of a few days, like the patients in, that, um, in, the, in the Australia group. You know, it was, it was people that were completely well on a Friday and then in hospital on the Monday. It's that kind of illness onset, whereas schizophrenia normally um, is a sort of much more gradual decline in functioning over several weeks and months. 
That's not to say that everybody with an abrupt onset to their illness has encephalitis or has an antibody because a lot of people didn't or that we could identify, but everybody with an antibody had an abrupt onset, if you see what I mean. The other clue that we found was the response to antipsychotic treatment. So the standard treatment for psychosis is to give drugs like risperidone or olanzapine. Uh, and we found much less therapeutic response if you had an antibody to antipsychotic treatments. Some people have adverse response, you know, so it actually, you know, they can't tolerate them and they have very bad reactions. And that's also a clue that there's something else going on. But in general, people, if you don't have an antibody, you tend to get better in your psychosis for, um, from antipsychotics. But it's, it's not universal because actually antipsychotic drugs themselves have an immune suppressant role to some extent. So it's not a clear cut issue. Okay, but the big million dollar question really is the so what? Can we treat people with um, psychosis, with psychiatric presentations, with these antibodies, um, with immune therapies, and do they get better? And that's what we've been trying to do over the last few years. So I run a joint clinic with, neuro, with neurologists and we treat anybody um, that has an antibody, whatever their clinical presentation, they might have seizures or they might have psychosis or they might have a movement disorder. If they haven't got better, with symptomatic treatments, then we will offer um, treatments with immune therapy. And we've been trying to um, sort of standardize this and we've been trying to write it up because we think it's really important to get the information out there for clinicians around the world really. So far we've done um, a feasibility study and we've published case series data. This was our feasibility study, which really just was there to show that you can treat people with immune therapy when they're very mentally ill. Um, so it just showed that we could deliver the treatment um, properly. Um, and this was IVIG or a plasma exchange. It was the choice of the neurologist which treatment they gave. And it also showed that people's psychosis got dramatically better, particularly if you had an NMDA receptor antibody. This is the psychosis symptom scores before treatment and six weeks after treatment. So nothing else was changed apart from the immune treatment, essentially. And the psychosis scores, basically 170 or so, is about as high as you can get. Um, so these were, these were very unwell people, several of them. And yet six weeks later, um, they were essentially symptom free. So we're in no doubt that if you have an antibody and you have a psychiatric presentation, you, you get better in exactly the same way as if you have encephalitis. But this isn't enough frustratingly to change practice. This is unusual. Most places around the world, there's um, a level of, um, what shall I say, suspicion perhaps, or not quite believing that this is um, a safe treatment to give people. Um, and I, I rather controversially put all of our treatment response data alongside that encephalitis data. So these are our, our patients that we've um, published so far, 27, it's not that many, but of all the patients that we treat, they tend to get better in exactly the same way, I would suggest, as the patients with encephalitis. And if they're not treated, they don't tend to get better. But we need more robust evidence that this is actually the case to get into treatment guidelines because it's such a dramatic change in practice for psychiatrists. So we're running a, a randomized controlled trial just to let you know, a double blind placebo controlled so nobody knows if they're getting the treatment or not. And we're looking to see um, whether we get people better. And we're sort of partway through, I suppose about a third of the way through running this trial. It's really hard work, but it's really important for, you know, for everyone that we gather that evidence. Okay, so that's where I'll finish. I'm, I'm sure I've talked for far too long. Um, I suppose in summary, um, Patients with autoimmune encephalitis present to psychiatry. We know that, you know, 80% of people will present initially to psychiatry. So psychiatrists really need to know about this disorder and be suspicious. There's nothing particular in the clinical presentation to pick out people with encephalitis. So they need to be suspicious of everybody, I would say. You need to test people 
um, particularly people with an abrupt onset to their illness, particularly people with any of those red flag symptoms. Our experience so far is that people with psychiatric presentations and these antibodies get better with immune treatments rather than with antipsychotics. But because it's such a dramatic shift in clinical practice, we really need the sort of gold standard proof before we recommend that or before people will accept that practice because you know it would require psychiatrists to do lumbar punctures. It would require them to give um, you know, biological treatments that can't currently be given in mental health settings. So I would say that it's possible, it's likely that autoimmune psychosis is a thing, that it's real, um, but we're still frustratingly a bit of a way off before it's standard and before it's accepted. So I'll just finish by acknowledging this is a, a big group effort and I work with a large group of neurologists, neuroimmunologists and psychiatrists across um, England and, and broader and funded by, um, by charities and by government. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking us through this. And it's really fascinating to see that, um, you know, you really highlight um, the fact that there are, in fact, people waiting to be quote unquote rescued, like many of, uh, of the patients that have been on this journey to, to um, discover. Interestingly, you actually focus on identify the antibodies. And, uh, you know, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time, you know, in the last two webinars that we just had talking about people that may not have identified antibodies, uh, mm -hmm. right? So I think, um, is there thinking from your perspective, uh, you know, how does that sort of differ or, you know, how do you guys view that sort of as a long-term objective? Or are you just at this point would like to just focus on, on what's known and then sort of explore from there? Well, it's, it's really, it's a really good question, isn't it? Because my suspicion is all of these antibodies have been identified so far in patients with encephalitis, haven't they? But what about all of the other, what about the other 95% of patients? You know, I bet there are another percentage that have an antibody that's yet to be identified. And at the moment, we can't separate them out based on their clinical presentation. So we've got to develop the new tests. We've got to do the discovery science to, you know, to identify those new antibodies, and then we can really make advances. Thank you. So from a perspective of a guest presentation, and I think you spoke to that pretty uh, in detail, really, it's, it's, it's a bit of a garden variety, really, but um, um, you, you talked to the sleeping patterns, and I think that was one of the things that uh, we've heard from the neurology group is that that's not really something that they are particularly focused on. Uh, I guess from your perspective, are you guys viewing this as a psychiatric symptom, or is it more of a sort of broad dysfunction in the, in the brain, really? I think it's, it's really fascinating, isn't it, because it's, um, it sort of cuts across everything, I think. <laughs> doesn't it? Um, but it, it's really striking to hear it described. And actually, you know, particularly in the potassium channel antibodies cases, I quite often hear that this is the sort of prominent first symptoms that people describe is absolutely stopping sleeping, you know, for several days, almost entirely, you know, um, and that's the sort of the start of everything. So um, yeah, we understand so little, don't we, about sleep. It's really fascinating. So in, 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 in your clinic, do you manage sort of, I, mean, I think an MDR is a little bit different than I guess in a lot of other manifestations really, but it, it's more monophasic, I guess, but uh, do you see any sort of relapses? And if so, how does that present and how do you respond to that? Yeah, so um, you're right. Mostly we consider it to be um, monophasic, but in, I suppose in about a quarter to a third of people, will have um, a relapse. Um, and so, so what we normally do is we, um, we treat people acutely with IVIG or with plasma exchange, and then we give them a course of steroids or something like rituximab. But then after about six months, we will stop that and we will discharge people. We will expect most people then that, that'll, be, that'll be the end of it. Um, and then, but of course, to be alert to any early warning signs that things are coming back. And then we would treat again 
and if someone has a, a relapse I suppose we would we would keep them on treatment for you know for a couple of years realistically. But from an observation perspective have you seen I guess you know uh, sort of a return of the symptoms um, you know and, the, and, and psychiatric symptoms really and how do they present do they present similarly of what you see in acute stage or do you see something slightly different maybe? Yeah, so it is mostly in, in the acute phase. Um, so, um, but really interestingly, um, we do also see psychiatric symptoms as a sort of long-term consequence of encephalitis. So it's now quite well described that there is um, an increased risk of new onset bipolar disorder um, after um, encephalitis. And actually it's a, it's a greatly increased risk compared to something like new onset epilepsy. Um, so it just seems to be, you know, a vulnerable brain if you've had encephalitis for having other problems. And of course, other sort of psychiatric um, difficulties are, are very common with every serious illness. So anxiety and depression, I would see a sort of longer term issues with anyone that's had a serious life threatening brain condition. Excellent. Um, so we've got a couple quick questions here on schizophrenia and MDA, et cetera, and seizure interactions. And I think um, a lot of the sort of, I guess, um, so we have a, a seizure specialist coming to talk to us in the next, uh, in the next podcast here. But I think the question is really more distinguishing between sort of those non-epileptic seizures and sort of, you know, I guess what you would call the functional neurolog neurological seizures. Mm -hmm. as they would put it. Um, um, could you speak to that in terms of how is this being viewed and, and managed? So yeah, so your seizure expert will be much better placed to answer that one than me. I suppose um, seizures, uh, so in, in some of the um, in some of the disorders like LGI1, like the potassium channel mm -hmm. antibodies, um, seizures are very common and very difficult to treat. And actually, you know, treating the, the underlying condition is the way that you you manage the seizures. Um, with NMDA, it's, it's, it's actually relatively uncommon. You might have a seizure or two, but it's not a big, big issue. But again, you, you wouldn't expect people to need, um, you know, anticonvulsant drugs once their encephalitis is treated. So it's, it's a bit like the antipsychotics. You treat people, it's symptomatic treatment, um, acutely and then once you've treated the underlying cause of the problem you don't need those medications going yeah. forward and and presumably you'd see the changes in what have you this the non-specific abnormalities that are typically seen in the eeg and the like that would abate with the treatment as well yes yes absolutely absolutely Great. Um, so then we got a couple of questions on, you know, what's safe and what's not safe in managing, you know, what an autoimmune psychosis. So I think there's probably a couple different camps of, of uh, physicians. Some say you do nothing other than immune therapy. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that say, uh, let's try some other things to help the process along. What's the sort of general research consensus if there is one? Yeah, no, it's, that's a, it's a really good science? question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question because um, in practice, in reality, people often end up on everything, don't they? You know, yeah. and, <laughs> and, then, and um, then you can't really tell which it is that, that you're ultimately trying to, to, to manage. And, 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 it's, and it's even more difficult if someone gets better. Actually, you know, most people don't stop things, do they? They just carry on. And, and the risks of longer term treatment, particularly the antipsychotic drugs, you know, have significant risks in the longer term. So, um, you know, our thinking is if you have a definite autoimmune psychosis, you need immune treatments to treat that. So most people will have short term antipsychotic drugs and they will be helpful to some extent. But as soon as the treatment, as the disorder is treated, then they should be, you know, reduced down and stopped. You shouldn't need them in the longer term. So, and I guess um, to that end, uh, if the patient presents to a psychiatric clinic first and the psychiatric dr drugs are tried and, you know, in effect are somewhat masking the symptoms, yeah. they might never be offered the next step unless they truly decline significantly. 
Although um, that, that's a really good point as well, absolutely. And that's my suspicion of what happens, that there are lots of people who are, you know, who will never know. That would be uh, a sad statistic, <laughs> should that actually happen. Yeah. Um, all right, so there's a, another question, which I guess, and, and I'm not sure if that's something that the research you focused on maybe or not, but uh, have you seen sort of um, anything in the studies where you've considered, you know, given that most of these disorders present in women, is there any correlation to psychosis and changes in hormones and onset of autoimmune problems? So Has that been looked at from any angle at this point? Yeah, that's a really good question because there's a, a huge association with, um, with illness that starts after childbirth. So there's a huge increase in psychiatric illness with onset, you know, within a couple of weeks after giving birth. And of course, huge hormonal shifts at that time. Um, and you know, one study that showed an increased rate of antibodies in, in those people. Um, so certainly, um, and then there's also a very interesting relationship between all the sort of sex hormones and with your more um, with 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 the hormones that the body produces, basically the natural steroids, if you like. So actually the interaction with the immune system functioning with hormone cycles is also really fascinating because I know a lot of people describe getting worse with their periods you know and whether that's you know how that how that uh, it's not really understood but I you know I think it, it must be it's, it's all to do with the immune system isn't it that's behind everything basically you would think that females seem to, to, to have a lot more fun with the immune you know that's I guess that's why we have three to four, you know, three to one ratio in, in autoimmunity. Um, all right. So some of the things in terms of, you know, do you see uh, treatment resistant yet antibody positive psychosis? And what do you do then? Yes, we do. And um, we don't really know what to do then. <laughs> so I, I I see people um, in in my joint clinic and we would think very hard and discuss with people and with their families as to what to do um, because the evidence base is really unclear. Um, we just don't know. And, and giving immune treatments, you might say, well, well, just, you know, just treat people, but the risks associated with giving treatments are also, you know, they're not, insignificant so you really need people to be able to weigh up the pros and cons of that and to be able to understand the issues um, but we have treated people that have been unwell for you know three four years um, and they have got better often you need quite a lot of treatment you need to be quite intensive with what you treat people with um, but yeah but it really needs a specialist to to oversee that and it may probably go with the uh, sort of how long have you been sick before you got diagnosed and other factors, which is yes. something that the neurologist talked to previously. And the sooner you get diagnosed, the better you are. It comes looking back at your chart that you just presented. Exactly. Um, exactly. You know, it, it really is an, um, a disorder that's difficult to, to understand and, and appreciate the gravity of unless you're actually faced with it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so from um, some of the other questions, and I think this is more of a general, you know, we've, I think it, we've gotten, we've given it to every speaker so far, but from a perspective of sort of, you know, specialist versus, you know, kind of more of a comprehensive approach to patient care. And, you know, I think some of the neurologists poke fun at the fact that they're, you know, really a cell doctor, or they, they focus on seizures. And I think you just sort of pointed, alluded to that to, to, to a degree as well. Um, but, you know, what is the thinking in terms of sort of, um, you know, what's better really from kind of a practice perspective and patient management outcome? Is it better that, you know, there's more of a coordinated, uh, cohesive approach to, you know, focusing on, let's say you have multiple presentations, so it would be the psychosis, the dementia, the seizures and, you know, movement disorders. Should you have four specialists talking or should, <laughs> should, should the patient be really the one in the middle trying to solve the, you know, the Rubik's cube, which is really not a fair place for the patient to be 
No, absolutely not. Well, I suppose my dream in the future is that um, whether you're a psychiatrist or a neurologist, that you would be able to specialize in this disorder and you would have all of the skills and expertise to be able to assess people comprehensively and provide holistic care, whether that's psychological, medical, you know, whatever, all in one clinic space. I mean, that's got to be the way forward, hasn't it? That it doesn't require a postgraduate degree to go and navigate your way around different specialists, that actually we should provide everything that's needed in one place. That would be quite lovely, really. But <laughs> I don't, don't think that's quite, uh, you know, I, I, we understand that it's difficult. We understand that, you know, the disorders and the presentations are so heterogeneous, really, that even, you know, your study shows that it's not like you could pull together a, a symptom list that's really easily identifiable. No, but if everybody was aware and was had a low threshold for testing and for looking for it and then knew where to refer people to if they had a, a positive, that would be a starting point, wouldn't it? Yep, agreed. Um, so from some of the other questions we got, uh, and I'm not sure if you you know look to that at this point. I mean, obviously there's a lot going on with COVID and there's a lot more research happening with sort of trying to come up with therapies you know, to address COVID issues. And, you know, we know from some of the other research that some of the same sort of, you know, receptors that that, that are being impacted by, you know, neural, neuronal cell antibodies are, are also those same things that are being affected by some of these other treatments, which is why, you know, most of the AE patients fare a little bit better than, than the rest of the world, <laughs> should, you, should you have COVID. But I guess from a sort of treatment perspective uh, in your field, have you looked to anything else out there and sort of like, you know, besides the standard sort of group therapies that, that are kind of more well established at this stage? Um, um, no, other than that if you have, there was a paper in, um, in JAMA last week to show that if you have schizophrenia, your risk of dying from COVID is um, second only to being old basically. So it's a huge risk factor, whether that's the illness, the treatments, or the sort of the comorbidities that go with that. Um, there's something about, um, yeah, of, of being at greatly increased risk. The only, the only sort of psychiatric treatment that I saw, which was quite unusual, was an antidepressant. Fluvoxamine has been trialed and shown to be effective in COVID. I have no it's idea why. <laughs> but, yeah. That's a weird one. I guess I guess some of them must have some kind of a immunomodulatory properties that that aren't being studied yet. Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, that one's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So whether you've got serotonin receptors in your lungs, I don't know. Um, it's it's an interesting one. So from a perspective of, and this is probably, um, I don't know if you would view, um, you know, findings from celiac disease as part of the sort of your psychosis department or, or how is that being viewed? Is that, is that again, you know, more, you know, I mean, clearly there's, there's psychosis presentations with that as well, or is that kind of being studied separate? No, it's, it's, it's not really being studied at all. So. <laughs> It's, it's just been it's been sort of acknowledged and recognized that that's always been the case but we treat you know in in our clinical services and you know in the states as well all around the world we, we just have one approach to treating psychosis we make no distinction as to what might be causing it we give everybody the same is that interesting yeah <laughs> so uh, it's, it's uh yeah I think we hear a lot from the patient's perspective that that is a challenge in, in you know trying to navigate and convince a physician to sort of look to beyond um, you know uh, trying to distinguish really what's the driver and we appreciate the challenge on both sides of the house really when absolutely it comes to that. but you know we've had we've had decades of not finding anything so we've almost kind of given up I'm talking as a profession psychiatrist mm -hmm. we kind of think well there's no point investigating so Let's just, you know, get the treatments and we know that, you know, social and psychological interventions are helpful. Let's get those in place, you know. 
So we just have a sort of different mindset in a way. Yeah, that's fair. And, and we appreciate you trying to sort of, you know, advance the mindset on both sides of the aisle, really. I think it takes, you know, to the tango, it takes neurologists and psychiatrists to address it together. Yeah. Um, don't think it's otherwise going to get fixed. So from, you know, the, and if you have another minute or two, um, I think we have a couple other quick questions here. Um, did I do want to dig into too much, but um, are there any medications that you would, you know, I guess from a psychosis, autoimmune psychosis perspective, um, sorry, from um, if there's a steroid induced psychosis, how would one uh, manage that in the autoimmune setting? Oh, yeah. So it, it does happen sometimes that actually giving people steroids um, can make them psychotic. Um, but, you know, the treatment there is to stop the steroids. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then you, you expect things to quickly get better, you know, within a few days, really. Um, so that, that's how you and, and it's really interesting because, you know, initially everyone said you can't give people with um, psychosis and antibodies. You can't give them steroids because it, it'll make them worse. But I, I think it's quite a good discriminator as to the cause of someone's illness if you give them steroids and it makes them better because that's um that's quite a good sign isn't it yes it is indeed um i think you know and it's it's interesting because keeping track of all of your symptoms uh, and trying to figure out which it is <laughs> yeah. oh absolutely yeah yeah it is difficult right um so i think that's about all of the sort of more or less Right questions we have. Uh, the rest of them, I think, you know, to the extent that they're not raised. Um, actually, one more if you have a second. Yeah. So, from a perspective of potential for an actual permanent damage, and how do you differentiate? You know, I guess if you're, you know, back to that, I think that was sort of some of that treatment um, that we've talked about treatment resistant people. I think, you know, and I'm sure it's more of an art versus science, but I'm assuming, you know, when you see something that's persisting and not responsive, then I'm guessing that's more of a team effort and, and the uh, other matters like rehab would need to come into play and, and further understanding of what's driving the cause, really. It's, it's really, it's often really hard. So if people get, get unwell again and you're not sure whether it's active illness or a sort of a consequence of illness, then what we do is we look for inflammation. So again, a lumbar puncture looking for inflammation is the best indicator we've got. You know, if there's absolutely no, nothing going on there, um, then we can be quite, you know, as confident as we can be that it's not active uh, inflammation. And similarly, if we've given some someone sort of robust treatment, if we've suppressed their immune system so much that we just know realistically, you know that there's nothing left <laughs> to cause that inflammation then that's also quite a good indicator so you know we it, and it, it, is, it is the art versus science bit you know um but it's sometimes the case that we you know people are resistant to the treatments that we've got and we don't understand why and it's you know i'm, I'm assuming some of it is different what's done is done and then mm. you know, essentially hopefully you're relying on the rehab and support of supportive mm -hmm. positions to, to get you to the next stage through the symptoms management. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got one more doozy for you if you have a minute. <laughs> so in, in helping patients overcome, like, let's say, you know, they've ended up on a, on a psych ward uh, uh, diagnosis inappropriately in, in sort of helping patients overcome some of that um, challenge, you know, what are sort of some of the recommendations that you would have, um, it, you know, in trying to address that? I mean, besides you fighting for, for, for on our, on the patient's behalf. I know, <laughs> I know. Um, well, I, I suppose um, sharing the consensus guidelines might be a good start. <laughs> I mean, and, and what I say to, to clinicians is it's only a blood test. That's what, you know, that's the starting point. Um, if you have a high suspicion, yes, sure, you need you need the lumbar puncture, you need the other investigations. But as to start off with, what about just doing this blood test? It really isn't such a big deal. Um, or getting a second opinion. I mean, you know, I hear so many families who have to be so persistent and 
I, I, I don't know of a better way through Oksana other than being that persistent, but you know, until you've had been investigated properly, you can't really rule it out. So uh, yeah, I, the others might have a better suggestion. <laughs> I think everybody's in just about the same uh, reaction, you know, but this was uh, just, I guess, you know, as patients, we're just looking for guidance and feedback. And I think as a, as an organization, we're trying to provide information to patients to empower themselves to be able to, to deal with uh, some of the sort of challenges that are uh, standard. But uh, we're certainly at the top of the hour and well above the 45 minutes we, we were allotted to speak. So we appreciate you um, taking the time to answer all the questions. Uh, for our group, to the extent that we get uh, any follow-ups, if you wouldn't mind, I would just, uh, you know, send you a note privately to to see if we can get additional insight. But we thank you for, uh, you know, advancing our understanding and sort of uh, promoting this collaborative approach between the uh, psychiatry and, and neurology and helping us uh, move forward with, with hopefully finding a bit more productive dialogue and fewer of this of a disease. Thank you so much, Oksana. Really appreciate you making time for us. Bye, everybody. Okay. Take care.